from tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Wednesday afternoon, June 28, 1978. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp Summer Camp Meeting being held at Hot Springs, Arkansas. Speaker of the afternoon is Wynn Worley. For the first one, we just sing, I'm free again. You don't have to ask me at once. I kind of, I'm kind of hung up on it myself. You can play it, can't you, Bonnie? Agnes, you can play that, can't you? It's in G, I think. It's F. It's an F. Okay. Now for me to pick the wrong key. If you remember parts of it, join in with me, okay? So the host of hell prevails, and the demons come past me about. And they tell me that God is against me, that he will not help me out. God in heaven will enter and save me, and the armies of heaven will battle, while the angels of darkness shall flee at the light of his majesty. Oh, the Lord is my light. Oh, strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? For I'm free, 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 yes, I'm free, free, free. Oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, for Jesus has set me free. Though the host of hell prevail, and the demons come past me about, and they tell me that God is against me, that he will not help me out. God in heaven will answer and save me, and the armies of heaven will battle, while the angels of darkness shall flee at the light of his majesty. Oh, the Lord is my light, oh, Strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? For I'm free, free, free. Yes, I'm free, free, free. Oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. For Jesus has set me free. And all the people said, There's another song I'd like to sing just before the message. It goes right with it. called I See Jesus. <laughs> Once a man named Stephen preached about the Lord. Folks were safe and folks were healed. As they heard God's word, Satan did not like it. Soon he had his crowd, and as he was stoned, they heard Stephen cry aloud. I see Jesus standing at Father's right hand. I see Jesus. Yonder in the glory land Works all over Soon I'm coming to thee I see Jesus Standing, waiting for me <laughs> As the stone fell round him Beating out his life Stephen knew he'd 
soon be through from all toil and strife. So much like the Savior with a heart so true. He prayed, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. I see Jesus yonder in the glory land. Work's all over, now I'm coming to thee. waiting for me. Through the gates of glory, down the street of gold, march the hero of the Lord into heaven's fold. I can see the Savior on the great white throne. I believe smiled and said, be but welcome home. I see Jesus handing out his father's right hand. I see Jesus yonder in the glory land. Work's all over, now I'm coming to thee. waiting for me. Let's do I'm free again, all right? Though the host of hell prevail, and the demons come past me about, and they tell me that God is against me, that he will not help me out. God in heaven will answer and save me. And the armies of heaven will battle, while the angels of darkness shall flee at the light of his majesty. Oh, the Lord is my light. Oh, of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Free, 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 yes, I'm free, 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 yes, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, why Jesus has set me free. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, would you turn, please? To Acts chapter 6. <clears throat> Acts chapter 6, beginning with verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now you would expect that when ministry that was so obviously blessed and anointed of the Lord would come, your first impression would be everybody would be excited about it. And they were. But some were not excited with joy, but with rage and fury. And many times we make the mistake of thinking that because God's Spirit is moving and blessing and because miracles and wonders and signs are following the Word of God, that just about everybody, and particularly those who profess to know the Lord, are going to be real excited about it and be so glad about it. But it isn't so. And so you find uh, there were a group in the synagogue who got all upset. And if you start seeing people healed and delivered, other miracles and signs coming, you see the gifts of the Spirit operating, you'll find many churches get terribly upset. But you know how my favorite about that is, if the Apostle Paul came to town, you know he'd be invited to the biggest church in town, probably the First Baptist, wouldn't you think? And um, he would, uh, he'd come in. He had the house would be full. There'd be a line outside. They'd have a traffic jam outside. Oh, first assembly. Well, I'm a Baptist. I'm, I'm going to put him in the Baptist church. The assemblies might accept some of No. <laughs> when I get a little further, you'll see why I put him in the Baptist. 
<laughs> now, let's put him in the first Baptist pulpit. We'll let him go over to assembly later. Uh, they, uh, but you can see him walk in, you know, and he comes in, and of course everybody's glad to see the great apostle. And he stands up and he said, Greetings, brethren. I speak in tongues more than you all. He just ruined the service, didn't he? And then he makes it worse. He says, I would that you all spoke in tongues. Can you imagine the horror of those good Baptists? And about that time, they're getting the committee to usher him out the door. And as he goes out, he says, forbid not to speak in tongues. He just wouldn't fit in some of the modern-day churches, would he? And, of course, if he came in casting out demons, they'd cast him out some places. Yeah, <laughs> they'd cast him out of the assembly. That'd get him out of the assembly, wouldn't it? They, they could take the tongues, but they wouldn't be able to take the rest. Isn't that something? Oh, my. Reminds me of a story I heard about the little lady, you know, that you probably heard it. It's an old preacher tale. It's supposed to have happened. I don't know. These preacher tales always happen, you know, somewhere, sometime. I think this happened in a Baptist church, too. Man, I'm sorry. In my Baptist orientation, you know, all my stories come out of the Baptist side. But uh, anyway, this little old lady was a shouting Baptist. Kind of a rare breed nowadays, but 50, 60 years ago they weren't. But uh, at any rate, uh, when when preacher got to preaching and he'd get steamed up on the blood and the sufficiency of the redemption Christ had wrought and all the glories of Jesus, uh, she'd take off and she'd start hollering. She'd whip, he had a little handkerchief, she'd whip that handkerchief there, whee, woo, she'd just shout. He'd get all excited and jump up and down and praise the Lord. Well, they got a new preacher in from the cemetery, seminary, and he uh, he had his homiletical outlines and everything, and as he stood up to preach his first sermon, he made a mistake. He took as his text the blood of Jesus. And that always got that sister set off. You know I mean? She always got excited about that. And so, sure enough, she took it just about as long as she could, and he just kept steaming in on the Word of God about the blood, the blood, the wonder of the blood, the cleansing power of the blood, and the sufficiency of the sacrifice of Jesus. And he was really coming. And his outline was coming along just fine. And all of a sudden, she went off. Whoom! And she started shouting. And like, he, like, jumped out of his shoes. He'd never been in a place where anybody shouted. And uh, so after the service, well, some of the deacons saw he was upset. And they came up and said, Now, Pastor, we noticed that just so-and-so kind of upset you. Said she's kind of strange. And she does that every once in a while. He said, but now you don't worry about that. We know that upset you. He said, yes, it did. I got off my outline. And, uh, I couldn't find my place, you know, and uh, and it got him all shook up. So she, he said, uh, but said, now you don't worry about Pastor because we got it all fixed up. If she does that again, the ushers are going to come right in. They're going to come right down the aisle, and they're just going to get on each side and pick her up and just walk her out like there's take her out like there's something wrong with her. And they'll just scoot her out on out and disturb him something. He said, oh, I thank you so much. That'll be such a help, uh, you know, because I was really nervous about that. So they went along several services, and then he, he came down the middle on the cross one day. And he got to talking about the glories of the cross. And, and pretty soon she got, she got upset. And she, boy, she came unglued, and she started popping that little handkerchief and shouting and praising the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And she was wh whooping around like a wild Indian over there. And sure enough, here came the very efficient ushers. They came right down the aisle, and they got on each side of them, and they picked her up, and out they went, you know. And she, as she went out, she was whirling that handkerchief and shouting and said, Whee! Jesus rode into town on one night being carried out by two. Whee! So you'll have to realize that all the things that the Lord does with his people are not always acceptable in all circles. Now, Stephen got tangled up with these folks in the synagogue. There were several of them here. The Libertines, the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, those of Cilicia of Asia. They were real smart theologians. They probably graduated from Dallas Seminary or someplace. Real learned. And they came up with all their arguments. I, I run across those kind of folks every once in a while. <laughs> they come up to me and I say, Hey, look, you know, did you know something? I know the arguments against what I'm doing better than you do. And I said, It won't do you a bit of good to argue with me about it because I said, The Holy Spirit showed me. And unless the Holy Spirit shows you, you'll never understand it either. And, I, I, you know, it's just a waste of time to argue about such things. They said, But I don't believe in speaking tongues. I said, You don't either, do you? And he said, No. I said, See? <laughs> As those who believe, huh? I don't believe in casting demons out of Christians. I said, you don't do it, do you? No. I said, well, that's the reason it says those who believe do it. Hmm? It's all a matter of what you believe. I said, when I didn't believe it, I didn't speak in tongues either. <laughs> all right. 
Now, he said they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now, we've heard messages this morning that point this up, how God can give unusual wisdom, and by the power of his Holy Spirit, he can override the opposition. Now, that doesn't necessarily make the people who are overridden happy. As a matter of fact, it makes them fight mad. In, in fact, if you'll chase through Acts, you'll find that when people were cut to the heart with conviction, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it says they were cut to heart. The Word of God always does that when it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Word of God, is, I think of it, it's like a bullet, the head of a bullet, and in the shell, the powder is the Holy Spirit, and you and I get to aim the gun and pull the trigger if we'll walk with the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit goes bang, and out goes the bullet, and it hits with power. Now, when the Holy Spirit empowers the Word of God to cut into the heart, because it has to be that way, because if the Holy Spirit doesn't empower the Word, then people won't believe. Right? Now, the Holy Spirit hit with great power when Peter gave forth the Word. And the men were cut to heart, and they said, Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter told them. Now, you'll do one of two things when you hear the Word of God and the Holy Spirit makes it real to your heart. You'll either, when you're cut to heart by it, you will either want to know what you're supposed to do and be willing to obey God, whatever it takes, to repent, to humble yourself, to throw overboard something, or to add on something, or else you're going to get fighting mad at the one who shot the bullet. You'll be like the children of Israel. You won't get mad at God because he's pretty big, good size to take home, so you'll get mad at the fellow who shot the gun. Read the children of Israel. They got mad at Moses. They didn't fuss about God. They didn't say God brought us out in this world. They said, you did it. I can't blame them. You know, you wouldn't want to take They felt like they could take on Moses. They didn't think they could take on God. What they didn't realize is that when a man is led of God and he's walking in the will of God and you follow the word of God and the Spirit bears witness to it, you are taken on God. Amen? And what a responsibility there is on those of us who have leadership positions to be sure we know what we're talking about. I tell you, it's no wonder James says, not, let not many of you be teachers or leaders because they'll be judged with greater strictness. Before you decide you want to be a leader, you better check out and see if you want the responsibility that goes with it. Amen. Everybody wants a paycheck, nobody wants a job. Isn't that right? In spiritual matters, it's that way. Everybody wants a paycheck. They want the reward. They want to be up front. They want to be seen. But are they willing? Are you willing to pay the price? Did you know something? When we get to heaven, we're going to have the biggest shock in our lives. When God hands out rewards, he's going to call some people to the front that we never heard tell of. That's right. He's going to say, would uh, sister so-and-so please step forward? And all the angels are going to just shout, break into shouts. And we're going to think, well, who is that little old woman? I don't know her. <laughs> Where did she preach now? She never preached? He'll bring her up there and say, here's one of my precious ones. She spent most of her time in the closet. But she moved mountains out of missionaries' paths. She broke the backs of demon power because she hung on to God and prayed and wept and cried all night a lot of time when nobody knew except me, but I knew. Oh, that's when the books are going to balance, friend. Don't you worry too much. Don't let us get wrapped up in trying to balance the books down here. Eye for eye, two for two. That's God's business anyhow, isn't it? We don't have sense enough to swap it out if we knew. If we had the power to do it. Let's let God do it because, oh my, when he straightens it out, it's going to be beautiful. Tell you something else. Did you know we've got wonderful surprises coming in heaven? I saw a rabbit run across the trail. I gotta shoot him while he's running. Did you know that when we get to heaven, did you know that you reap what you sow? Amen. Now most of the time we hear that and you say, Yeah, that's right, you gotta really be careful because boy, the bad things will really come home. They will. But there's another side, if you sow the good things, they also. And that sometimes is neglected. Did you know that when we get to heaven, we're going to find out where all the seed that was sown went? Do you realize that many times if you poured your life out into the lives of others, it has gone around the world and you didn't even know it? Because God knew you'd get all puffed up and couldn't handle it. So he just didn't bother to tell you to get to heaven and you have a glorified body and you take it. Isn't that merciful of the Lord? He didn't want us to mess up our rewards by finding out too much. And don't get too worried if you don't find out the results of what you're doing. You know, uh, I mean, if it isn't on the bulletin board, so you can see how many, you know, you don't need an ad machine. God's got one that keeps better track. 
And when we get to heaven, a lot of those people who have the big adding machine totals, God's going to say, by the way, we have to subtract most of those. Cancel. Zero minus. And some people who didn't bother to keep track are going to be shocked when the Lord says, come forward. You say, who, me? I'm just happy to be here. And the Lord will just say, no, but you know, you sowed some seed, bread on the water. You did something for me that nobody else knew about. Just me and you knew about it. You spent time just with me and you. You didn't do it to be seen. But like the widow's might, it caused the Savior to take notice. It's not how much you give, it's how much you got left over. God's more interested with the balance on hand than he is the balance you put in. If you got much, you give much. If you got little, you give little. God's scale is so fair, isn't it? Now, we're going to have some beautiful surprising surprises. These men were not able to resist the wisdom nor the power that Stephen spoke the word of God with. When they couldn't win the argument, when they couldn't face the Scripture, when they were overwhelmed by the power and the wisdom by which Stephen spoke, they should have given up and repented. But they chose a different route, and they hired some men and told them, said, Now, this is what you go say. You say, We heard this man speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Well, that's high treason, you see, in the religious route. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. That's what Jesus said over in Matthew. They'll bring you before the council. They'll, you'll be persecuted of all men for my sake. And Stephen was getting, they got a hold of him. They arrested him, took him up before the Sanhedrin. And uh, they lied about him. Oh, how different today. Somebody lied about me. I'm going to have a pity party. Me, myself, and I are just going to play Ring Around the Rosie and feel sorry for myself, huh? Did you ever have a pity party? You ought to dismiss it and have a hallelujah session, huh? The Bible says that we ought to rejoice and be exceedingly glad when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You know why some of us can't rejoice and praise the Lord when we're persecuted? Because it's not for righteousness' sake, it's for our own stupidity. God didn't say be stupid. He said, if you do this for my sake, that doesn't mean you put a chip on your shoulder and you run ram into everybody you meet, and then when they haul off and stop you, you say, oh, I'm suffering for Jesus' sake. No, not necessarily. Don't be presumptuous, just be in the will of God. And then you will be persecuted. These blessings, it says in another place, will come with persecution. Isn't that awful how he tagged that on, put that trailer on there? I mean, he got that nice new car out there, blessing. And you look and it's got a trailer hitched onto it, with persecution. Now, what do you want to do that for? Well, one thing, I think it gives us some balance. Keeps our feet on the ground. Keeps us from being super Christian, number one. See my buttons? My little Sunday school chain. Oh, my. How we need in these days men and women who will get to the place where they honestly don't care about themselves. The material blessings they have, they accept as blessings from the Lord to be used for His glory. They bless His name for it, and yet they're not attached to them. So that if they lose them, they'll not have any fear. You better get like that. You better learn to hang loose with the Lord. In the days that are coming, don't worry about your house. You may not have it too long. Don't worry about your car. You probably won't get to drive it anyway. I mentioned here uh, something about the Illuminati the other night. Uh, the book, Nan None Dare Call It Conspiracy. If you haven't heard about it, you ought to... If you haven't heard you don't know what I'm talking about, read that book. Maybe it'll scare the daylights out of you. It might even scare the devil out of you. You can't ever tell. <laughs> written by an atheistic Jew, but he's really zeroed in on the political scene and the structure of the international conspiracy. To get the Christian perspective, read Pat Brooks' Return of the Puritans. All hell has broken out in her household ever since she wrote that book two years ago. She got enough flack when she wrote out in the name of Jesus and using your spiritual authority, but boy, she really caught it. She was in our home not too long ago, she and her husband, and uh, she said, uh, nothing has compared with the 
flack that she's caught since she tied into the Illuminati in return of the Puritans. My new book's going to take a pot shot at them, so we may be running too. <laughs> also going to plow into the Freemasons. I'm, I'm in favor of all Masons being free, I'll tell you. I even be, believe in gay liberation. I want everyone I'm to be liberated. And I know how they can get there. Now, they'll move against you, friends. The enemy will definitely move against you. They moved against Stephen. They arrested him. He didn't wring his hands and, and say, Oh, poor me, here I am serving God. Bless my heart. And all these terrible things have come upon me. And when you meet the hand-wringing brigade, brigade, that's not God's people. Do you know that? He marched right up there. They set him down in front of false witnesses. They stood right up there before the council and lied. They said, we have heard him say this, that, and the other, and everything they said was lies and twisted versions of the truth. Nothing was actually true. And the key to it is, verse 14, we heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and change the customs which Moses did. Now, if you really want to run, uh, run into hornet's nest, friend, you try to change the customs. I mean, you try to get the you try to get the, the uh, Sunday school report board down off the walls. It's been up there all these years. You try to move the organ on the other side of the bench when it's been there for fifty years. You move that yeah, you know, change pen. You know, in some churches, I don't know. Of course, I'll have to go back to my Baptist uh, background, Brother Glenn. But in many Baptist churches, the choir is known as the War Department. That's pitiful. Instead of singing praises to God, they're singing, whose who's turn is it to sing the solo? And who's she, anyhow? What she thinks she's singing for? And what, he, what do you want to do that for? Oh, my. Isn't that pitiful? How the devil has run away and gotten people off. I have a suggestion. I know how to clear the choir law. Throw a demon fight up there. They'll run in every direction. They won't be worried about who's singing what. But seriously, it'll straighten out a lot of the kinks that are in the strip. I saw you're not old enough to remember how to call it. It was a patent medicine that was absolutely good for everything. I mean, they advertised across the country, across the South anyway, and they, it would cure or help just about anything from ingrowing toenails to snorting in your nose. You know, I mean, it was, I think it was half, uh, half blackberry wine or something. <laughs> A lot of people sure took Hattie Call. <laughs> they took to it. But nevertheless, seriously, I, be I believe that the deliverance ministry is an undergirding pillar for the whole body of Christ. It will not do everything. It will not substitute for any valid ministry that God is already doing in a church or in a group. It will not take the place of repentance. It will not substitute for Bible study. will not substitute for prayer. will not substitute for battling with the old nature and putting it under the heel of the Lord, bringing it into subjection. It is not a substitute for faithfulness to assemble yourself with those who believe and become a part of a body that's moving forward for the Lord Jesus. And it does not replace any valid ministry that the Holy Spirit is working in a place. But it undergirds, deepens, and enriches, and strengthens every real ministry that's going on there. But it's hard on the customary things that men have dreamed up and have they've been there so long that everybody thinks it's in the Bible. You know? And when, when deliverance comes through, it rips the covers off, and you see that's no good. As a matter of fact, that could hinder. And you start changing the customs, and you'll get, you'll get a hornet's nest going. And this is one of the big things. Now, they put some other charges up, but the thing that really upset them was that what Stephen was preaching, what he was doing, what was coming through his life, the power, the wisdom, and the dynamite of the explosion of the wonders and signs, was upsetting and causing a change in the customs. Now, they'll charge you with a lot of, of religious gobbledygook. 
But if you look close, the real reason they're upset is because you're attacking their customs. Did you know it's very seldom that there's a real church fuss over doctrine? Most of the time they're locking horns or something else. Now they'll talk about doctrine, but that's not really what's upsetting them. It's the customs that are under attack. You. Now Stephen could have jumped up and screamed and torn his hair and said, How dare you, I'm right. And you know what he was doing? The silly outfit, he, he, they, all of them looked over there after the witnesses announced their charges, this terrible man. He's blasphemed Moses. He's done this. He's done that. And he said this. He said that. And they line up one side and down the other. And then they turn, everybody in the council chamber, the judges, they turn to look at Stephen. Here he is. They looked steadfastly on him and they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. He was off in another world visiting. He couldn't be bothered with what these people were chipping their teeth about. He was so excited about what God was doing. He was so caught up in the presence of God, the people who looked at him said his face looks like what I think an angel's face would look like if I were to see one. Now, they, uh, the high priest turned to him and said, Are these things so? And he started in. He even preaches his last sermon. And he, he, wrote, he winds up and he lets them have it. Now, he starts off, and you ought to always do this, start off with what they believe. He started in the Old Testament. He started off with Abraham. Well, they're all in favor of that. And he starts going through the history of Israel. He traces Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. He takes them through the wilderness. And those learned teachers are sitting there, yeah, that's right, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's true. They're getting along just fine. And they're agreeing with him. And I think some of them might have even got to where they almost liked him. Just a little bit. Because he seemed to, you know, he was quite a... He was speaking the truth. And, uh, but he gets down to a place. <laughs> and in verse about along by 47, he's coming in for a landing. Well, not really a landing. He's coming in for his bombing run. Up till now, they've been right with him. Now watch him. Verse 47 of Acts 7. But Solomon built God a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. When he said that he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, you can see him stiffen up. He's attacking our building, our building program. The building committee built this great sanctuary. Did you ever, were you ever where they built a great sanctuary? For great things were going to happen. But the greatest thing that ever happened was the air conditioning bill. Amen. My, my. Now, he said... <laughs> uh, uh, he said, though, that God doesn't dwell in a, in a temple made with hands. And then they started stiffening up against him, and he said, As saith the prophet... Hold it, big boys. Wait just a minute. I'm still on the scripture. The prophet said, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? And you can just see the consternation come over those fellows. They don't want to receive what he's saying. But after all, he is quoting scripture again. What is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? And they're standing there, sitting there thinking, How are we going to head this radical off? And he, it's almost like he reads their minds. Maybe he did. I don't know. I'm going to ask him when I get to heaven. And he said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. I mean, he, they came unglued from the bench. I mean, he, he just, he's just floating along here and Bible history just flowing out of him. And they were, they were saying, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, well, what's he getting at? Mm-hmm, yeah, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. And then all of a sudden, he just swings all his big guns and locks them in, and bluey, he lets them have a broadside and blows them out of the water. I guess he figured if he's going out, he might as well go out in a blaze of glory. And he let them have it. They, never, they may have never heard another sermon, but they got one that day. Ye stiff necks, that means you proud, you arrogant, and uncircumcised in heart and ears. He said, you've been so careful to take the outer mark of the covenant, circumcision, in your flesh. 
But your heart isn't circumcised. Your ears are not circumcised. And ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Always, he said, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted? You can just see those men. No, no, that's not right. How can he say those things? And he just lets them have it. said, well, which of, you, which of the prophets your fathers didn't persecute and pound? Which one of them? Name me one they didn't go after. The same tribe you're in, the same bunch of hypocrites and proud and arrogant ones who wouldn't receive the word of God. And have slain them. And which have showed before the coming of the just one, the prophets who gave the prophecies about the coming of Jesus Christ, he said, you have slain them with wicked hands of whom ye have now be the betrayers and murderers. He said, they talked about his coming and you killed him for that. Your forefathers killed him for that. And he came in person and you killed him. You betrayed him and murdered him who received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it. He said, you have a holy book, but you haven't kept it. You talk about it, but you don't do it. That's dangerous words in this court. Now, when they heard these things, they were cut to heart. And they said, Oh, Stephen, what must we do to be saved? <laughs> no, they were not interested in salvation. It says, They gnashed on him. They were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Years ago, when I was in college, I used to preach on this passage. And I was talking about, you know, uh, how much do we love the Lord? How much have we suffered for the Lord? And I'd say, have you ever been bitten for the Lord? Where's your bite marks? Well, then we haven't done as much as Stephen did, have we? I've had to alter my preaching slightly. In the last seven years, I've been chewed on several times. And I didn't really know then what I know for sure now why they bit him. I just thought they got mad at him. And they did. But it was considerably more than a mad they had there. The demons in them were so enraged and so infuriated and so frustrated, they leaped on him and bit him. Now, of course, I know that if Stephen had been walking in the will of God, nothing could have hurt him. Because we all know that those who are in the center of God's will cannot be hurt. Even though they walk through a battlefield with Bursting shrapnel, no harm can come. They hung Jesus on a cross, Amen. and he perfectly kept the will of God. Amen. Stephen was right in dead center of the will of God, and they jumped on him and bit him for it. So if you get bit for the same reason, you're in good company. Amen? Amen. I tell people in deliverance, you're the quicker the bitten. You either move right quickly or else you're, you'll get snapped. In our, play, in our place, we call it battle scars. Nothing to be afraid of. I don't want anything biting on me. Well, I don't think they enjoy it necessarily, but I mean, it's not kill you. I mean, look like I'm doing pretty well, don't I? I've been chewed on considerably. <laughs> you say, well, I'm not going to bite you. Well, good, I'll pray for you then. You're not going to do any biting. Now, but seriously... These demonic forces were so enraged and so frustrated, they literally leaped on Stephen. And if you can get the picture of these dignified leaders of Israel, the judges in their robes and in their, all their formal attire, the high priest and all these priests with their flowing garments, their official garments, here they are, and they just literally go berserk and jump on this man. They don't even argue with him. They just... They just come on him and leap on him and start biting him. And he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears. <laughs> you know how he stopped them from biting them? He started talking about, Oh, I see Jesus. That did it. They ran the other way. They ah, don't want to hear it. I've seen that. I've seen them. No, no, I don't want to hear it. By the way, if they ever do that, just say, oh, you can hear without the ears. And they can. 
We used to waste a lot of time trying to pull the hands off the ears, you know, because they'd close the ears. They can hear all right. That's right. They can see with the eyes closed, too. All right. Now, they cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. They said, oh, he's doing it again. And they grabbed him and they drug him out. And I don't think they did it very gently either. Did you ever see a demonized person explode? I never saw anybody any very gentle, did you? If you ever see one, you'll know what they did. Only multiply it by a number. It wasn't just one person exploding. It was one person who was the, the target of all the fury and rage. And here we have a dozen or maybe more men going crazy all at once, going after this one man. And they cast him out of the city. They threw him up, against, probably against a wall, and stoned him. They began to throw rocks, heavy rocks and to crush the life out of him. And they laid their clothes down at a young man's feet whose name was Great One. So, that's what it means, Great One. He changed his name later and became Paul, which means Little One. And they stoned Stephen. By the way, this is when the Holy Spirit set his hook. You ever go fishing and set the hook? You get a nibble? Saul was standing there so arrogant that old boy deserved it. Kill him. Yeah, let him have it. Smash his head. Blasphemer, talking about this Jesus of Nazareth. I'm glad he's getting it. But Saul didn't realize the Holy Spirit was fixing to set the hook. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Stephen called and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Saul felt something go, Ow. I'm all right. And Stephen knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. <clears throat> and then when he said this, he fell asleep. He crumpled over dead in the pounding of the stone. But the hooks had been set. You know something? I was telling you about drawing rewards on things that you forgot all about. Did you know something? You say, oh, how pitiful. This great man Stephen died just as he was getting going. His ministry had just begun. Wonders and signs, powerful words. You know something? Who do you suppose enlisted Saul of Tarsus? Who do you suppose drew residuals on every single thing that Paul ever did, ever wrote, and is still doing? Every soul that ever was saved, every heart that was ever encouraged through the ministry of Paul while he was on the earth, and even 1,900 years later, this, these letters that Paul wrote, and every time somebody comes home, Paul and Stephen do a dance around heaven. There comes another one. Stephen said, I'll join you on that. Woo! And around they go. That's right. Stephen's just as excited about Paul's writings as Paul was. Friend, when you sow your life, it brings forth. Amen. But remember this. Stephen was like that alabaster box the woman brought. The alabaster box had to be broken for the ointment to break out. And when you break the box, it's ruined. It can never be used again. Now, she didn't just pour the ointment out. She broke the box. Now, the box itself was valuable. The ointment was worth a man's wages for a year. But the alabaster box it was in was also of great value. And that woman took that and she crushed that box. It could never be used for anything else again. If you do as the Lord had me do one time, and I was a young believer and ask him to break the alabaster box of your life and don't just jump into this you think about it and pray count the cost he'll do it but it'll break the box and the box will never be fit for anything else anymore and the ointment will run out though and Jesus will be magnified 
And anything that's poured into that box after that, it can't hold because it's too many cracks. And it just runs out. If God pours his love in, it just runs out. That means you have to constantly be close to the Lord to keep getting fresh supplies because you can't store up anything. Stephen, the box was broken, and the sweet savor of his life poured out in that bloody massacre there by the wall. But the sweetness of that favor set God's hook into the apostle that was chosen from the time he was in his mother's womb. And he was going just as hard the other way. And Jesus tackled him on the road to Damascus later. And he fell down, and Saul cried out in agony, What, should, what do you want me to do? Praise the Lord. Saul of Tarsus became Paul the mighty apostle. And you talk about residual. You talk about was Stephen, was his life wasted? I would say no. Paul took the gospel across the world. He's still rocking the world for the portions of scripture that he wrote. How about Andrew? who went and found his brother Peter. Don't hear too much about Andrew, but wow, look what Peter did in the Acts, in the two letters that he wrote. Look at the lives that have been touched and changed for the glory of Jesus Christ through that mighty apostle who did what Andrew didn't do. Could we understand that if we are the instrument to get somebody else in track, it's as good or better than being in track ourselves. You see what I'm talking about? There was a man, a Sunday school teacher one day, who called a shoe salesman into the back room and led a man named Dwight L. Moody to the Lord. Now, I don't know whether that Sunday school teacher ever led anybody else to the Lord or not. Perhaps he did. But his most famous convert, everybody's heard of. Dwight L. Moody shook two continents for God. Amen. Somebody's going to win these people to the Lord. Some people, I think, waste their lives skewing and straining and trying to be something God never purposed them to be. Instead of finding the place God wants them to be and being content to be what God wants. When you do that, you'll accomplish the greatest good possible. Somebody else may do the thing you're not cut out to do. And you may spend all your life being frustrated trying to preach when God didn't call you. When, as a matter of fact, you might have helped three or four men who were really called to preach by encouragement, by prayer, and other ways to give them encouragement, and they would have gone, and you would have had residuals drawn back far more than if you'd ever preached yourself. If you could just catch a vision of what it means to just be in your place where God wants you to be, wherever that is. Does God have a place for everybody? Well, of course. Everybody has a place in God's economy. You can find it. You can know it. God is not making a mystery out of it. You say, well, I don't know where God wants me to be. Well, look, God is more anxious for you to find your place than you are to find it. Did you know that? You say, well, I can't find it. Well, then there's only one fellow that I know I would be mean enough to cut you off from understanding what God wants you to do. You say, who are you talking about? Well, that's the devil. And now I'm back to my favorite subject. Why don't you get mad at him? Why don't you attack him in Jesus' name? You say, well, I never did do that. Well, it's high time you unlimbered your spiritual muscles and got them developed. Learn how to use the authority in the name of Jesus Christ to break the powers of darkness if they're blocking you off from God's supply, from God's wisdom, from God's understanding. Brother Flynn's been talking to us about uh, loosening up and loosening the things that God has put within us. I believe God has loaded everybody with things that they have. They've got packages on the shelf with their name on. They're just catching dust on the will call department. You call lately and ask. Well, no, I just sat here and said, Lord, hit me with it. Well, now, you know, it says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. 
Now, I know that some people, you know, they say, well, you just you speak once and it's done. Well, now, that's great and that works for some things, but that's not the only scripture on prayer in the Bible. Instead of being the speak and it's done philosophy, I more tend to be the speak until it's done. I like that little widow woman that harassed that judge out of his socks. She showed up every day, pounding on the door. About third or fourth day, I can just see him saying, Bailey, she's not out there again, is she? Yep, she's out there. Oh, good land. She's back again. Day after day, the Bible says, she stayed after him. She wanted what she wanted, and she kept after it. She got it, too. I like the story about the householder. These were lessons Jesus taught about praying. I think he knew more about it than some folks. Jesus said another example of prayer is when uh, at, late at night there was a knock on the neighbor's door. He said, Who is it? I'm your next door neighbor. Get up. I need some bread. I had company come in. I hadn't got a thing in the house. Of course, all the stores were closed. And uh, he said, Well, I, oh, no. Come back in the morning. You have to remember they had small houses. When they went to bed, they unrolled mats, and it was wall to wall people. He said, well, if I get up, I'll have to step around all the young ones and stir all the kids, get the baby up crying, and, and get half the kids up gnawing around. I have to go clean across the house to get that bread. No, come back in the morning. Uh-uh, I can't do it. Oh, go on home. i got to have some bread. Come on. Get up. You've got to loan me some. Come on. No, I'm not getting up. Oh, go home. But, you know, he kept on. He spoke until it was done. And Jesus said, those are examples of prayer. Now, I have no objection in speaking and it's done. I think that's great. And there is, there are times when that is very valid and it gets things done and praise the Lord, it's quick and it's, it's efficient and everything, but don't kid yourself, that's the only kind of praying there is. Some of these speaking it's done people, if they get into deliverance, they'd find out you have to speak until it's done. It wouldn't take them long. Because speaking it's done, the demon just look at you and say, you crazy. You say, but I told you to come out. He said, so what? I'm not coming out. He said, well, you're defeated. Well, I know that, but I'm not coming out. It kind of shatters your theological theories. I mean, they sound real good, you know, when you discuss them all over the coffee cups, but you face the demon... And you tell him, you're defeated. He said, okay. Well, come on out. No. Well, you don't have any grounds to stand on. That's right. Well, come on out. You have to come out. No, I don't. I'm not going to do it. I, I would love to have some of these speaking it's done people come when we're dealing with a real raunchy one. And I'd invite them to go over and speak. Have it done. No, there are times when you speak and it's done. There are other times when you speak until it's done. And God gives you enough sense to know which is which and which to use when, huh? Praise the Lord. Both are valid prayers. Thank the Lord. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to come in your heart, or if you're not sure that Jesus Christ lives in your heart, wouldn't you like to be? You don't want to go all your life and be uncertain, do you? Jesus loves you. Died on the cross for your sins. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. And if you've never asked Jesus to come in your heart, or if you're not sure that you have, by all means, why don't you settle it today? It's very simple. Don't make it complicated and religious. Jesus didn't. You simply pray something like this. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here now, come into my heart and save me from all my sins. Now, this should clear up the confusion should put you on a basis to get peace, love, and joy in your heart. If it doesn't settle the confusion, by all means, seek help. Don't go away in a confused state of mind, but come and just say, tell me or one of the workers up here at the front, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. It's that simple. And let them take the Word of God and sit down, because you'll never be sure about salvation until it's based on this book. You can feel all you want to, but the devil will rob you of your feelings. A lot of people, you know, when they feel good, they feel safe. When they feel bad, they feel lost. That's kind of like this, you know. I don't be like that, do you? 
We're not saved by sin. Of course, it feels good to be saved. But uh, you want to base it on something that will stand the test of your emotions. Go beyond your emotions. Get on bedrock. That's the Word of God. Amen? Then you can have all the joy you want. Once you know, you can release. You can be released from fears, from confusion because of the Word of God. So seek that to be grounded first. The next thing, if that's not your problem, you're certain about your salvation and relationship with the Lord, by all means we would encourage you, if you're being harassed, driven, or tormented in some area of your life, it can be mental, physical, or both a combination, it can be spiritual, you can have all kinds of pressures and problems. This is the end of this message. Our website is www. LakeHamiltonBibleCamp.com and LHBCOnline.com There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.